Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the third uh, Geochemistry Group Careers Panel for this year and the final one for this year. So we'll be taking a rest um, next month, um, but back in 2022. So our session today is going to be on careers in the public sector. We have three fantastic speakers lined up for you today um, who I'll introduce in just a minute. Uh, but firstly, um, some, other, uh, some other things. Um, so we are now on YouTube. Um, we have been recording the sessions um, and the second of these is now up for you to um, have a look back at if you missed it or if you want to see it again. So um, that's the panel on publishing. Um, we also have some geochemistry group news. So uh, we have, uh, we're starting to prepare the panels for next year. Um, we'll be moving to once every two months um, rather than once monthly, but we see these as still occurring sort of roughly on the last Wednesday uh, of the month. So in February, we'll be looking at uh, what it's like to work in the research councils. April will be focused on SciComm. Um, and June will be, um, have speakers from the environmental consultancy um, sort of sector for you. Um, I'm also gonna take a moment just to, oh no, sorry, I am missing a slide. Uh, so I want to just flag that we have some um, uh, awards for ECRs coming up. So there's the uh, Early Career um, Postdoctoral Medal, which is for a paper um, by a postdoc published in 2021. Um, and also there's going to be the Early Career Lecture Series. So there's details for those on our website. Um, so head over there and have a look. Um, deadlines are the 15th of January. So a little bit of background about us. Um, with the geochemistry group, we're here to promote geochemistry as a discipline, um, but as you might've gathered also to support ECRs. Um, if you're not an ECR or if you're not a geochemist, that's okay. We hope that you'll still get something useful out of this session. So before we start, um, please uh, be aware that you should have read the code of conduct on your way here. Um, if you somehow missed it, I'm just gonna drop it into the chat and I ask that you take a moment to uh, review that uh, now. And um, basically just please be excellent to people, please be respectful um, uh, is, is what it boils down to. Okay, so I'm now going to introduce our speakers. Today we are talking about careers in the public sector. Um, we have Dr. Rian Rhys Owens, uh, Dr. Emmanu Emanuela Piga uh, and Dr. Donald Payne. Um, so, um, Rian currently works as International Climate Science Lead uh, in the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, or BASE. Rian's PhD looked at Antarctic paleoclimate using climate modelling and geochemical proxies at the University of Leeds. During her PhD, Rian completed a NERC policy internship at the Government Office for Science. She did a short postdoc at the University of St Andrews on the links between the carbon cycle and ocean circulation, and then joined the civil service as a science advisor in the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategies climate science team. There she led on climate impacts and adaptation, including representing the UK at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. After this, she moved to DEFRA, um, which is the Department for uh, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, where she led a team providing analytical support to UK engagement uh, with international conventions on biodiversity, including work with UN bodies and G7 and G20. She has recently moved, I will just stop sharing that. Um, she's recently moved back to Bayes as International Climate Science Lead for the IPCC. Um, so I'm gonna make sure everyone can see you guys there. Um, okay, Dr. Emanuela Piga, um, if you'd like to just wave. Yes. <laughs> um, Emanuela is the Decarbonation Evidence Advisor and Climate Change Analyst in the Decarbonisation Energy and Climate Division of Welsh Government in Cardiff. Her PhD used the geochemistry of microfossil shells to reconstruct the ocean temperatures of the Eocene and ancient greenhouse climates, as well as comparing the results of paleoclimate models. Emanuela did her PhD at Cardiff University, together with the Natural History Museum of London, exploring their microfossil uh, collection at the start of the project and University of Bristol for the paleoclimate modeling. During her PhD, she had the opportunity to do a secondment at the um, Great Western Four Plus NERC PhD funding body provided, which provides these opportunities. Um, as this has, had to be unrelated to her project, and she was particularly interested in policy making and environmental politics, she did a three month internship in the same team where she works now at the Welsh government. Emanuela applied for a job there right after finishing the internship and while finishing her PhD. 
Um, and our final speaker for today, um, Donald Payne, is Land and Air Quality Technical Officer at Fife Council. Um, his PhD was on glaciation and climate change in the central Andes using radiocarbon and thermoluminescence dating at the University of Aberdeen. Um, Donald spent six years working in digital cartography before joining the council. His current role involves understanding soil chemistry, groundwater flow and contaminant fate, as well as risk assessment and a little bit of human toxicology. Over the last few years, he has won awards from the Association for Public Service Excellence and Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, as well as being both winner and highly commended for two different projects at the 2020 National Brownfield Industry Awards. He also recently contributed to a World Health Organization paper on redeveloping contaminated land. Donald is currently investigating landfill mining for research recovery, but also to prevent ongoing pollution and to repair damage damaged land and geothermal energy from flooded mines for district heating in areas of high multiple deprivation. So a lot going on there. Um, welcome to our speakers. A huge, huge thank you for being here today. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and I'm going to kick off with a comment that um, one of you made when you submitted your bio, which was um, community benefits are at the core of public sector work. So when I was um, sort of pulling together this panel, um, I was a bit worried at one point that maybe you were sort of very much spread out over different sectors within the public sector. Um, but that comment, that little comment that one of you included actually made me feel a lot better. Um, and that's, yeah, maybe I'd got it right. So does someone want to sort of come in and expand on that and maybe tell us a bit about what it is you do and what your role involves at the same time? And I will pick on people if no one volunteers. I suppose I'd better step up. Um, I, I feel that uh, being a public servant is a, a useful thing to do. Uh, and it's also a, you know, the council's a very good employer, especially during lockdown. Um, I, I was already set up for home working. I, I was al already accustomed to holding meetings online, have been for more than a decade. So, um, that, you know, that's a good starting point. Um, in terms of a... Uh, being at the centre of, of uh, the community, I think uh, an example might be the easiest way to illustrate this. Um, we, we've set up in our council a, a, a resource sharing agreement with other local authorities where we work together. So instead of employing consultancies, we buy our own kit and effectively we've created our own sort of mini consultancy. Um, one, one of the things that came up last year and one of the things Jess has already mentioned we won an award for was a community project in Rutherglen near Glasgow so that's not in my local authority area it's way outside my remit but the community group was looking to repurpose some land uh, as community gardens and they needed to investigate the ground and see if there was a problem with contamination. They didn't have enough money to employ a consultant, which would you know, cost at least 20, 30,000 pounds. And so they came to our uh, industry forum in, in Glasgow, who then came to us in Fife and said, can you bring your drilling rig over? Um, can you take samples? We'll get one of the labs involved. So they offered their time and services free of charge. Um, and we dressed it all up as a, a training event for early career professionals to, to learn about how to do contaminated land in the field. Um, so the end result of that is not only that we had a great day out in Glasgow, but also that the community group benefited from a low cost site investigation and got the answer they wanted and that project is now going ahead. Um, and, and also that the uh, that people who were learning their trade, they uh, had an opportunity to, to do some hands on work. And that, that's one example of, of the way my work uh, can expand way beyond the confines of the council itself and provide benefits to the wider community. Thanks for that. Um, Vian or Emanuela, have you got the... Um, Vian's jumped in. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Emanuela. Um, yeah, I think, um, well, I think what Gordon just described is um, a really powerful example of how working in the public sector can deliver community benefits and I think that's also it's that ethos that you see at all the different levels of the public sector from local government up to national government. I think in um, in my role so um, I lead on the UK's engagement with the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and I think what what's really important with that is that um, is making sure that the right information about 
climate science and climate change is available and accessible to everyone. So that's from policymakers at the highest level. So making sure, you know, that Member 10 understands what the climate science is saying, but also making sure that that's available to policymakers at my level, to local government, to businesses, to other organisations, and making sure that it's the right research questions are being asked that can help people from local communities up to the national level understand the steps that they need to take in order to take action on climate change. Um, yeah, so I, th I think for me, the, the real community benefit that I see in my role is, is that like enabling people to understand the science and that's a public benefit that, that everyone can, can gain from. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks so much, um, Emanuela, if you want to come in on that. Yeah, hi. First of all, everyone, and thanks for inviting me. Um, just like um, Rian and Donald said, um, I think for me, the key words was definitely useful. Still feeling like you're having an impact on climate change related matters. Um, so in my role, I analyze the emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions trends for wells. And the um, key aim, let's say, is to track these emissions so that we can reach the net zero target by 2050, which is now um, legislation for wells as well. So um, I, um, we just actually published, talking about COP, we just published the carbon plan for wells just before COP. And I was responsible for the emissions side of this plan. So display, you know, the trends from the baseline year, which is 1990 up to now, and compare it with where we are now in terms of carbon budget, how much have we got left? Are we still on track to reach uh, the net zero? Because obviously in between, there are also other interim targets that we need to respect. So for me, uh, also the benefits, just like Rian said, is to make the data transparent. Obviously we, we receive the data between, we exchange the data between different governments, but the public doesn't really get easy access to that in a way that is, um, in a way that is easily accessible and to, to read as well. So um, for me, it was important to have the data out there so that the public can track what the government is doing and also in terms of policies and proposals with respect to the emissions. Brilliant, thank you so much, all of you. Um, we've had a lot of questions sent in ahead of um, the session. So um, to the audience, although I will encourage you to drop your questions um, in the chat, um, we are, we're going to try and get through everything. Um, I'm going to start with the questions that have been sent in. Um, and to kick us off, um, there is a, a question where someone's asking, how did you narrow down your job search coming out of your PhD? I'm struggling to choose what types of roles to go for. PhD skills can be applied in lots of different contexts. I don't have any non-academic work experience. Um, so I know um, Rian and Emanuela, you both had... Um, Sort of internships or, or access to um, some experience prior to um, applying for your jobs, but do you, ha do you have colleagues or do you have any advice for somebody who's, who's looking to, to maximise their opportunities there? Um, I would say for me, what helped me before knowing, the, have, before knowing about this opportunity to do an internship outside of that, what helped me is to understand where I would like to grow the minority in the field of climate change. So for me, it was really clear that I felt like I had a knowledge gap between science impact and science outcomes and where, the, where does the science go, right? How does it get implemented? And what is the governmental procedure in order to then get to the final result, which is the law and the legislation? Um, so, and, but also, you know, I completely appreciate as well, because from other colleagues, they didn't really have um, this, um, this topic in mind that they wanted to explore. But I found, I found looking at job advertisements and also like people's profiles on LinkedIn actually quite helpful because you see what is out there. And I'm not meaning that you necessarily have to find a job that is already out there, but it definitely provides food for thought. Um, yeah, that's what I can think of. That's a great point. Um, Rian, do you, do you have colleagues yeah. who get a chance to do an internship or um, any advice? Um, yeah, I guess I, th I think it was um, for me, it was quite straightforward because I'd, I'd already done a research council internship. And so I I knew I had a pretty good idea that it was at least the public sector that I wanted to work in. Um, I think within within that, um, 
in my mind in the back of my mind I knew that ideally I wanted to work in climate science and because that was my background but I think I was kind of prepared to I was open to taking a range of different roles so um I guess you hear where we're thinking specifically about the public sector that all public sector jobs have to be advertised externally so I think what I'm Emanuela said about looking for job adverts and kind of using that as a way to gauge the types of roles that are out there. I think that's a good, um, it is one good approach. Um, yeah, I mean, I would also say that um, because the because public sector roles can be so um, varying and so diverse and so interesting, I would also say that maybe you don't need to narrow down your search that much. Well, it, I mean, it sort of depends what you want to get out of your career, but I'd also just encourage people to be really open-minded and, and look at the real um, diversity of, of exciting and really engaging jobs that are out there as well. Um, one thing I would suggest actually is um, if an internship is not open to you, um, through, a re through the research councils. Um, one, the Government Office for Science um, regularly advertises internships through the civil service jobs websites. So that's it, will be at a national level. And then you can be working on a range of, of kind of government science projects. Um, but also look at shadowing opportunities as well. So it might not give you like three months in an organization, but if you can spend a bit of a day here and there shadowing different people in different types of public sector organisations, then um, then I, that's a really good idea, a good way of um, learning a bit more about the types of roles and the types of work that you could be doing that, can, that might help you narrow down your search. That's a really, really good um, point that I hadn't considered. Thanks for that. Um, and Donald, do you ha you're coming from sort of a slightly different angle here, yeah, so what, what was your experience? Yeah, but I absolutely agree with you, Anne, about you want to widen out your search. There's an extraordinary range of uh, opportunities out there, and I, I, I really do feel that uh, there's an enormous amount of luck involved being in the right place at the right time. I saw my job advertised in the local newspaper. You know, it's not necessarily what you'd expect as a, a, a graduate with a higher degree. Um, and I, I, you know, bef before that, I think the other thing is, is perhaps to say that you, you need to be in work, even if it's not the work that you imagine doing for the rest of your life. I, I, I spent six years after my PhD doing basically, a, a, it wasn't a menial job. I was, I was a, working as a cartographer, but I mean, in, in many ways, it was a factory floor job um, for six years before this opportunity came along. And I, I also, when I was writing up my PhD, I got a job in a youth hostel, which was absolutely brilliant because I, it was shift work. So I, I was working in the mornings, I had all afternoon to write up and vice versa. I got my keep, I was staying in the building um, and it's easier to get a job from a job. So, you know, you, it, it doesn't really matter if, if you take a job that you might consider to be beneath you for a while um, while, while you're waiting for, for the right opportunity to come along. And, and as I said at the beginning, um, I think there is a, an element of, of, of luck. I think in, in a, a lot of ways, a, the, the person that's interviewing you is as important as anything else. Um, I mean, I, I am a geologist by training. I would uh, love to be working more closely with climate change, uh, which is what I did for my PhD. And that's coming into my job now, but it's taken years. Um, it's taken a lot of patience, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm now involved in uh, promoting district heating schemes and things like that, which uh, are, are, are really, you know, the, the core part of my, the, the, the most interesting part of my job. Um, and sorry, one more thing I was just going to mention is say uh, that a, sorry, I forgot what it was, but Rihanna, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just I actually just wanted to come in and add something off the back of what you just said, Donald, which was um about um you know not um not necessarily being super picky about the first job that you get because um I would say certainly in the civil service and I imagine that it's the same in other public sector organizations, there are many, many more vacancies available internally than there are externally. 
And so really all you need to do is get your foot in that door through that initial job. Um, so, um, you know, it might be a project management job when actually what you're really interested in is policy or science advice or, or something. But if you get yourself through that, that first door, you'll find that there are many more opportunities beyond that that you can then move into. So, so I guess also like kind of what Donald said, like not, not putting all of the expectations and the weight on your first employment opportunity because it doesn't have to be perfect. And you'll be in your career for a long time and you can, you know, be moving between between jobs and between types of role. And um, yeah, so I guess, yeah, being, being open to, to that as well. Yeah, that re resonates with me as well, actually, sorry, but uh, I mean, I just started last year, but I remember discussing it with other PhD students and I felt the same way. I felt like, oh, but this job, uh, you know, when I was looking at the different roles, like, oh, I don't really know what I want exactly. And, but then I thought, what is the long-term aim for me, right? It's not just looking at what you have in front of you, but where you want to end up, even though on the moment you don't know, but you know more or less about your interests and what field you want to stay in. So it is so true that many, me included, sometimes you were just looking, okay, now there is one part of this I don't really like, then on to the next but you'll never find the perfect job especially if you don't are first especially if you don't really know that um like public sector in this case enough but once you're in there it's just so much easier so yeah i agree with this completely and i would just add um that i i'm not a good example of this myself but i think it's really good to have people moving between the public and private sector and taking their expertise backwards and forwards yeah, I think um, sort of a, a, a more of a braided river uh, career approach is something that's that's being discussed in a few different places at the moment. Um, I'm going to push on with the questions because um, we've had a lot coming in. Um, I'm going to, I think the next one we'll take will be, um, how can PhD students best gear their studies and work to develop skills that are employable in your line of work? So I know we've talked to, we've mentioned internships, but separate to the internship, what skills, what knowledge, what what have you developed that is really useful in your line of work? It might be technical, it might be more soft skills. Um, and Emanuela, I'm seeing you nod, so I'm going to pick on you next. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually thinking <laughs> while I nod as well. So skills that we acquired during the PhD, right, during academia. Um, well, definitely analytical and critical thinking. Um, and, you know, I don't let anything slip unless I'm really, really happy with it. Um, but I felt as well, something that I have prior to the PhD, maybe more, is like interact, like I felt in the public sector, there was a lot more interaction uh, with people. That is something that I lost a little bit during the PhD because it felt isolating. So maybe like I found that skill useful to be able to work in a team and as a team during my PhD. And that was because that was the end of my academic uh, career so far. Um, I found that it was mainly me and the project quite independent. So I suppose that skill will be good to develop. And as well as I found in the public sector, you also deal with multiple projects at the same time, rather than just one and maybe like, you know, small collaborations with other research teams um, that I found also quite useful. And com compared to academia as well, I found that many times the public sector, you can get involved in projects that are not directly related to your expertise, but actually down the line, you may find that skill useful. So, and, you know, depending on your manager, of course, they allow you, they can see that in, in, the, in the long term that can turn out useful as a skill. I think it's always very, very good to get involved in this. But I thought that university is almost like, you know, marathon, right, to reach uh, the end of your PhD. You don't really, you, you don't really have time to look beyond this. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Brilliant, thanks. Um, Donald, do you have anything to add to to that? The first thing I would say is enjoy being a student. Um, make, make the most of your time when you're, uh, when you're uh, doing your, your research project. Um, it's, you know, you can't see into the future. It's not always clear what uh, direction your career is going to take. So do a good job of your PhD while you, while you can. I, I, I had two supervisors, one of them just kept on at me, you know, do, do good science. And he actually put it as bluntly as that. Um, his, his speciality was was much more volcanology, which I, I don't quite know how he ended up being one of my supervisors. But, uh, you know, that, that broad approach really helps to 
have uh, somebody else with a different point of view. Um, and, and my main supervisor just, you know, he wanted to see a good report at the end of the day. He wanted me to pass. He wanted me to, to get the qualification I was working towards. So, um, yeah, um, I, I never anticipated when I was doing my PhD that I'd work, end up working in public health. Um, I never anticipated I'd work, end up working in soil science. Um, you know, my degree, my first degree was in geology and it was very much an us and them. No disrespect to, um, to anybody else's say careers, but uh, you know, at, at that time, certainly for me, it's not something I, 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 I foresaw. Um, and yet here I am feeling that I'm using a, a wide suite of uh, skills that I've picked up uh, from my first degree from, I did a master's in remote sensing, I used remote sensing in my PhD. I then went on to do digital cartography, working as work, working with GIS got me my council job, I think. Um, you know, that was the main skill that the team needed and, and they brought, that I brought to it. Um, and, uh, and, and now, uh, as we mentioned right at the beginning, I'm, I'm uh, having to learn about uh, a lot about uh, contaminant fate in, in the water environment, having to learn a little bit about human toxicology, which is, uh, you know, so all, all these things come with time. And this, uh, you know, you, you continue learning uh, new skills. And uh, so, yeah, my short answer is uh, enjoy it while you can. Ian, do you have anything to add? Um, I mostly just to to really um, agree with what both Donald and Manuela have said. Um, I think uh, in, in my role and in my previous roles in the civil service, what has been, which have all been kind of evidence or, or science roles rather than policy roles, but what's been really important has been, I guess, the kind of more general science skills that I learned during my, my PhD. It's like critically evaluating evidence of, of any kind, having being asked a sometimes quite a weird question by a policy team or something and, and having to sometimes go away into the literature, which might be very new to me and work out, you know, based off a couple of papers, like a rough answer for that, that, that we can say is, is not completely wrong. Um, and then also, and, and I think some of those are things that, you, yeah, like Donald said, they come from they come from just enjoying your PhD and doing research and stuff. But that, but alongside that, I think the the kind of soft skills are also can be very important. So I, I spend lots of time communicating with policymakers and trying to help them understand these quite complex scientific concepts. Um, and you know, there's also yeah, working across multiple projects and being you know, like kind of you always have to be doing project management stuff, working with other people. Um, so, and, you know, kind of drawing different ideas together and bringing people together as well. So, you know, government can be very big and be working and you have lots of teams who are all very busy and working on their own things. So you know, how how do you get different people to engage with your idea and what you want to make happen? And those are all things that you're also doing all the time in your PhD and in your postdoc and, and through you know, if you're organising a seminar series or the kind of extracurricular stuff that, that PhD students do as well. Brilliant. Thank you all for your answers to that. Um, I'm going to move to um, a slightly different topic now. We've had a couple of questions come in um, which are on a similar sort of theme. So uh, will it be more difficult for non-UK citizens to pursue a public sector, um, a public service career in the UK and also, what suggestions do you have for international students building a career in science policy advising where opportunities are limited? Um, so, you know, obviously, academia is quite an international uh, I don't know, event field. You know, we have we have we have PhD students who've come from all over the world. But I know that for some roles in the civil service, you might be a bit limited in the opportunities. But I I don't know much more. So, if any of you have something to to contribute. Um, that would be awesome. And it might make <laughs> Yeah, yeah. For obvious reason, I may just start. <laughs> um, so, well, I applied as a European EU person, so uh, and I think that more or less works the same way as a UK citizen, uh, at least in the job description, that's what they say, they always classify you together. Uh, so from non-EU, I'm sorry, but I can't really, uh, I, I wouldn't have an opinion on this. But for instance, in the Welsh government, where we obviously have to have another 
Welsh. Oh. That's okay. Just uh, just carry on. That's Someone. Nice. Um, so actually, most of the job, at least back when I applied last year, um, they didn't require um, the um, the job applicant to know Welsh. And, and they always specify that, especially if you want to work in the analytical side of a team. So, of course, if you want to be the private secretary, maybe. <laughs> but um, I think, yeah, I didn't see personally any obstacles, both when applying for a PhD. But again, things have changed a lot in the past two years. So, Brilliant. Donald, do you have any insights on, on that, on sort of opportunities for international PhD students? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, hopefully it shouldn't be a barrier. Um, my, I, I think uh, the main thing I would say is that councils come under a lot of scrutiny from both politicians and from journalists to uh, make sure that they're being fair. You know, we don't we don't get away with uh, uh, anything in the council. Um, and if anything goes wrong, it's always our fault. So, um, you know, um, and th there shouldn't be any barriers to, and, and uh, you know, I see that in the council among my colleagues. Um, the other half of the question was say uh, more about the uh, the career in, in in policy advising, and and I think uh, to answer that, I would imagine that uh, you you probably need to prove your. I'm thinking about colleagues that I've uh, you know. That I've worked with, you may, you maybe need to prove technical competency before moving into policy, and and that's you know a an area that I'm perhaps only approaching now is say, you know, getting more involved with a uh, organisations out outside the council, a uh, and a uh, you know the people that are writing the technical guidance, um, that you know that that perhaps comes later um, for me anyway. Brilliant, thanks. Um, and Rian, have you, I, 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 I can't quite remember what the wording is at the bottom of job adverts, but maybe you can you can rescue me and, and uh, add something on that for your sector. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a go. I have to say I was having loads of tech problems, so I think I know what the question is, but I might not answer it precisely. Um, okay, um, yeah, yeah, so in up. terms of opportunities for, uh, I think I've actually got it on my computer screen. It's to do with opportunities for international students, specifically, or not students, but non-UK um, citizens. Um, yeah, so I, for central government, um, for some roles in some departments, there are either, uh, there are restrictions either related to residency or citizenship, which have now changed since we've left the EU. Um, so a lot, a lot of that relates to the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, so, but that's something to check. A lot, I think a lot of other central government opportunities are open to other nationalities, but I'm not sure if it's all of them. Um, so that's something that you would, they normally, at the bottom of the, the job description, they normally say. Um, and then I think there was the other part of the the question was about science policy advisory roles so um i think you can just if the job comes up you can just apply for a science policy advisor role and in central government the things that they, they will probably that you will be tested on uh, or assessed against will be the a lot of it will be those soft skills that I was talking about, so communicating, how you work with other people, how you can deliver um, busy and complex projects to, to time and budget. Um, and sometimes you will get assessed against technical, more kind of scientific competencies as well. And a lot of that will be more of, around how you work and deliver and guide the scientific projects. So a PhD is a really good, it's actually a really good example of that. Um, uh, I, but I would also say um, if it's policy that you're interested in, maybe you don't necessarily need to restrict yourself to policy that relates to science. There is there are policy roles that are uh, that cover anything, anything that happens in the country. There is someone working on that policy, so it comes back to I guess being maybe being open to the types of role that. 
Hopefully, and you're muted. Vian? Great, the great love of your professional career, Austin. I think we lost you for a bit there, but we're, we'll move on anyway. And now I muted myself because um, of the massive um, list of questions that we have. Um, so were there any major, I think we've, we've maybe touched on little bits of this before, um, but if we are, were there any major gaps in your subject or professional knowledge before you started these positions? And if so, was that an issue for finding employment or did you pursue further education or training before getting this job? Or maybe was there training provided um, for you? And whoever unmutes first is going to get it. I think uh, we, we started to answer this earlier. Um, any, any higher degree in any subject proves that you have a, a trained mind. Um, and certainly in joining the council, I had to shift from one paradigm to another. And but the, the basic skills are still the same. Um, so in terms of, of gaps, most employers will, um, will offer to uh, train you up, I think, um, in, in relevant things. And that's especially so in the public sector. There's a, there's a, a, a good sort of a history of, of people being sent on, on courses. I, I, I did two weeks in a Warwick University at the start of my job just to, to get me up to speed. At the same time, I was say, expected to sit and read an enormous amount of very dry documentation and guidance and legal stuff, um, which I didn't find very easy, but uh, thankfully that's, uh, that's done now. And I, you know, I can now feel confident in the, in the job that I'm doing. Um, when it comes to actually going to interview, uh, something I was going to mention earlier, remember you're interviewing them too. You want to make sure that where you end up is somewhere that you're going to like working. Um, so it kind of works both ways. Emanuela, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I think, um, like Rian mentioned earlier, actually, usually when you apply for an analytical position or it's more of a generalist scientist. So for instance, they're not gonna ask me about, you know, the geological interval I studied. So again, like also Donald uh, mentioned, we ha have those skills already that we developed during the PhD. So I, in that term, I didn't find any problems, but I did, what I found actually difficult, I still remember uh, last year when I started, is the um, reading of the documents that is really different. So in the, you know, in scientific articles, you find the information you're looking for pretty much straight away, because, you know, it's no more than 15 pages. Um, and there are a lot of different paragraphs and titles, whereas in the policy documents, but there were a lot of pages and it was not really getting anywhere. So I found that skill I really had to develop during the job. But again, I don't feel like the, when I apply for it, I have to have all of these skills. They allow a lot of room to develop that. And they obviously recognize uh, that you come from an academic background. So I think they're quite, you know, they're quite tolerant, let's say, in uh, providing this transition uh, between one uh, workplace and the other. Um, and also, I found it really, really easy to just learn by talking to people. Found like in academia sometimes I felt a bit um, guilty in asking for help because everyone is so overwhelmingly busy. In I've, whereas I found like it's more normal, let's say, for people to expect uh, somebody, somebody else to ask questions on something you don't understand. So a lot of the material I learned in the current job is actually discussing and you know debating and exchanging ideas with with other teams, not only my own. Brilliant. Um, thanks a lot. So Rian is having um, a few tech issues. She is she's still going to be here um, and we'll hopefully be able to get her to, to come in on, on some things. Um, I'm going to move on for now. Um, what was the most challenging part of starting out in your new career and was it what you expected to be the hardest thing? So big change of direction, maybe, or maybe not such a big change of direction, but was there was there something that was um, maybe not something that you foresaw would be tricky, or maybe exactly the thing that you thought might be difficult to get to grips with um, was. Okay, I'll, um, I'll go first. I think I mentioned a little bit in the previous question, actually, what I found challenging. I would say I would also add uh, 
definitely learn how like learn how to rely also on other people because a phd makes you really independent it's your project at the end of the day you're leading on it so yeah i found the teamwork actually and it's not just about being able to interact with people but you know rely on them and you know trust them and share let's say the, the work you're doing and then the policy documents i already mentioned i think yeah i think those were my main points I don't know if Brilliant. Donald, what, what were your, uh, did you have any or what were they if you did? Yeah, I think the, the main thing is say, uh, and it's it's not always easy when you're starting a new job, but just to have the courage to, to get on with it and make mistakes. Um, I, I suppose I was fortunate, not every boss is as uh, understanding as mine, but uh, he, he actually said at one point, if you don't make any mistakes, then you can't be doing any work. Um, yeah, I think things will go wrong, um, but soon you'll lay uh, begin to build up your confidence. That leads to competence, which is say, uh, you know, really important, especially working in the public sector as a regulator, public facing. Um, and, and you need to, uh, you know, you need to show show good face. You need to uh, come across. And so your, your credibility is, is very important. Um, in my own job, we built up these things by doing the job ourselves and not outsourcing to consultants. And uh, as a community, uh, I mean, my, my profession, my day job in contaminated land is very narrow. Um, and most councils only employ one or even no people to, to do that to, to do that job, which means that it's really important to have good uh, forum meetings between councils. So I, there are about 40 of us in Scotland. And something remarkable I noticed over the years, I mean, I, I've been doing this job now for... 15, 17 years, the people in post in the councils, in Scotland at least, and, and largely in England too, don't change very frequently. There's an extraordinary amount of, uh, of uh, stability in, in uh, you know, the, the, the list of people that I, I can go to for advice. Um, and so, like I say, all, all these things say... Uh, you know, might feel very challenging at the start, but you, you can soon build up a, that, that confidence and that, that credibility. I mean, Emanuela, did you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah just wanted to add as well, uh, in terms of, in fact, building confidence that, um, and knowledge about the job. I remember when I went for the interview, I felt like I had to know everything about environmental policies, all the, all the bills that have been passed in Parliament. But actually, again, like the interview is not about testing on your knowledge, rather whether you have those key skills, you know, like the critical thinking, analytical that we already mentioned that you would have anyway, like doing a PhD. So yeah, so I felt like I put a lot of pressure on myself with that. And actually in the end, I didn't do this because I had to prepare on other things with the interview, which is actually very specific in fact, in the civil service, uh, they have a very specific format. So it's not like a PhD where they actually ask you scientific questions. So yeah, so don't worry about that because I actually been there and I worried over worried and in the end I learned about the policy and I'm still learning it along the way and there are a lot of workshop opportunities in the government so brilliant and just to add to that um Rian says that uh so she, she agrees with with that and but also that you're much more embedded in a team compared to academia which is quite individualistic so um those soft skills those team working skills can be really important um so it's a change in mindset because of that and also uh, I think something that a lot of PhDs may be guilty of is, is understanding that you don't have to be the expert in things, which um, sort of that really resonates uh, with me at least. Um, okay, so moving on uh, to the next uh, question. What are the opportunities for career growth in your chosen career? So um, there's quite a, you know, we have this progression that we see in academia um, that seems quite uh, linear, but um, it can be a bit difficult for people who aren't in this sector to sort of appreciate what the opportunities might be. Um, so do you feel that you have the opportunity for career growth in your role? And, and if so, what, what is that? Um, what's that look like? And Donald, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, to be honest, I don't really want to be a manager because I see my managers um, whose jobs are entirely involved attending meetings and they don't do any real work anymore. They don't do any science anymore. So it's a bit difficult for me to, to answer that. I, I could choose a different course. I, I, I did have an opportunity to 
do my manager's job for six months. And I hated it. Um, you know, the, the extra money didn't even begin to compensate for the for the for the stress and, and for not actually feeling that I was doing anything useful. So I don't know if that's a very personal opinion. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm just being honest. That's where I am. I I, I do enjoy doing the job I do. I've uh, got an enormous amount of uh, flexibility in the council, an enormous amount of autonomy in what I choose to spend my time doing. Um, things like this, I don't even ask. You know, it's it's assumed that I'll I, I'll contribute where where I can, and uh, th those things are, are very important to me, and and uh, you know, much more important than the money. So. In, in terms of uh, professional careers, I, I feel that I'm part of a, a big network of uh, scientists, of academics, of uh, consultants. We're, we're, all, we're all the same people and at the end of the day, you know, no matter where we work. Um, I, I, have, I have this rule where I keep my LinkedIn account to only 100 people. So if I want to have somebody new, I have to ditch somebody because I think you can only really know 100 people well. And when I look at that list of people, um, you know, I kind of feel, well, I'm, I'm part of this, this national, almost international community of specialists. And, and that to me is, is, is important. Emanuela, do you have? Yes. Uh, so the straight answer is yes, there is opportunities for career growth. And I feel like there's actually, it's easier to spot them at least for me in the public sector I found. But like Donald mentioned, I think it's also subjective. There are two paths here. There's career growth in terms of becoming the specialist, the go-to person or specific topics and everyone just, you know, everyone just comes to you uh, for that field, also, especially if we also uh, receive questions from the public, in, for instance, in terms of emissions in our field and climate change. Or there's career growth in terms of, um, moving across the grade, like moving up the grades. Um, if And that obviously provides opportunities to expand your knowledge beyond what you usually do on every day, like in your team. So yeah, the straight answer is yes. And it's, but I find really useful to discuss these with other colleagues that maybe are like in higher grades or my manager as well, um, a lot easier <laughs> to discuss within the team. But yeah, I, I, I don't think you would have any problem for that. And also, like uh, I feel like as well, when once you're in the civil service, it's a lot easier to communicate with people across other organizations because you work with them on a daily basis. So, in fact, I feel like 50% of the people I know are from uh, the UK government or Scottish or Northern Ireland. So, there's a lot more interaction, so a lot more possibility as well to discuss with them. Brilliant. Um, and Rian has is, is added to that that there's many opportunities. The civil service is a great place to be if you want to progress. So, that's agreeing with uh, what you say. Um, although it's harder to do so if you want to stay in a particular area such as climate science you get a lot of support for your personal development it's also a good place to be if you're happy to stay put and just expand your knowledge and skills within a role um, there's not the same pressure to be constantly looking for the next thing as there is in academia if that's not what you want to do um, and the next question that we are going to move on to um, we, we're getting through them, so well done, everyone. Um, what are the pros and cons of working in a public sector setting versus academia? Um, what's the first thing that springs to mind there? Oh, there, there must be something. Oh, okay, I'll go again. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think I, I, I like to think that the, the boundaries aren't quite as distinct as that, that uh, you know, although my employer is, is the council, where uh, you know we're all paid nationally from the same purse at the end of the day from 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 tax to provide a service of of one description or another to um, to people. Um, so I I think osmosis between a public sector servants like myself and academia is really important. I work with a, often with the Strathclyde University because they have a, a strong a soil science teaching department. Um, and I've become very involved with them uh, in projects to do with uh, energy crop growing, uh, landfill restoration. Um, so, you know, the, the, the science, the, the opportunity to, to do the investigation and to uh, evaluate the possibilities is, is being done in academia. But the 
build landfill sites that are needed to study these processes are being provided by people in the council like myself who can uh, you know pr provide a, a test bed and and so I, I very much feel that they uh, we, we work together brilliant thank you um emanuela what do you think i have thought about this a lot <laughs> even before you know going for this job so a lot of pros and cons i think the key ones for me is pro of public sector uh, again, quite subjective teamwork. I just love working with people, uh, interacting. I just feel like I learn a lot more uh, from exchanging ideas and drawing ideas from others. Um, and then another one is, like I mentioned earlier, just working on multi multiple projects. So one pro of academia, sorry, I'm just going back and forth, uh, is obviously science-wise is a lot more stimulating, a lot more challenging. You're working on material that no one else has worked on, including samples. So in that respect, it's true, I have noticed uh, this jump, let's say, but you have to find your path, right? You can't just find it straight away. You have to listen to how you, how you feel like in the job as well. And for me, at least what worked is just get involved in different things. I found that really stimulating instead of just focusing on one, but really like deeply, like for the PhD, uh, working on different projects that I was not really familiar with, really mean, uh, gave me that brain boost, if we can say so. Um, but also I feel like it's not really a clear cut. Like, okay, you're going to the public sector. You're not really working with academia anymore. You're not really working with challenging science. At the end of the day, the government is also having collaborations with academia, at least in our, in our team, we have a few projects with them. So you're still able to interact with them, having the discussions and, you know, give, give your inputs um, as a scientist. Um, and also another point, sorry, my last one is, I feel as many times when we talk about, you know, oh, as a PhD student has analytical skills, you know, they are really had the critical thinking skills. Yes, we may have enough, you know, to do this job, but at the end of the day, you actually keep on developing those in the public sector. So, you know, don't think that it's not gonna be a learning curve in that respect, because actually I, I'm learning so much in that, um, just, just by exploring it, you know, from different angles. Brilliant. And I'm just going to add in um, what Rian has, has sent me on that. So pros, much better work-life balance, stability, interesting and stretching work and supportive job environment. Uh, cons can be hierarchical, but not necessarily any more than academia, uh, less travel. Um, and there can be a lot more processes and hoops to jump through. Academia is more freewheeling. Um, so we're coming up to five minutes to the hour. And I know that some people have got to get off to do um, to go to other meetings and, and to do other things. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap it up there. Um, a really, really huge thanks to all of our panelists. You've been really amazing. Um, and, and thanks for, for sticking with us through the technical issues and, and things like that. Um, so Rian has also just dropped in the chat that she's happy to answer questions by email if people want. So, um, and Emanuela as yeah. well. Um, I can do the email. They pressure Donald as well. So, so if you want um, to be put in touch uh, with our panelists today, you can um, get in touch uh, through the Geochemistry Group's website, and we will and we'll will be the connection there. Um, so do feel free. Um, thanks everyone again. It's been really fun. Um, huge, huge thanks to our panelists. Um, it's been brilliant, and um, we'll see you next year in February. Okay, take care, everyone. <laughs>